Hi everyone and welcome to the third episode of the Science of Sports look at pacing strategy and exercise performance. I'm Ross Tucker and what I'm going to do today is take you through the model that we proposed for how exercise would be regulated in anticipation of physiological failures and potentially harm in order to optimize performance. Before I get on to that, I just want to emphasize something that's come up in the previous two posts and that's this concept of pacing because pacing strategies are so obvious that I don't even think that a high school student would dispute them with you, the fact that they exist and why they need to exist. The problem is that in the exercise sciences they weren't necessarily recognized and one of the most important lessons that I remember learning when I was younger is I went home to a town where I grew up and I met up with a friend of mine who's a very successful and well-known international middle and long distance coach. And I thought I was very impressive taking him this idea that I was going to be doing my research on. And once I'd finished explaining it to me, he looked at me and he said, but that's nothing new. We've known that for 30 years and it's obvious. And I remember it was such an important lesson for me because it made me recognize that what we look at as scientists as being novel and uh, completely groundbreaking is actually stuff that coaches and athletes have often figured out long before. And the idea about pacing yourself is so inherent and so obvious to these people that sometimes it's a little bit of a hard sell because it's so obvious. Now, the, the problem is that within sciences, it wasn't. And as I explained to you in episode one, using the cartoon analogy, science has tended to view fatigue as a very distinct point. It's kind of like the event that happens when you can no longer exercise. So if you'd looked in a textbook in 2001, 2002, you would have found that the theory for exercise in the heat is that we exercise until our body temperature hits 40 degrees Celsius and then we fatigue because at that point our hot brain fails to activate muscle. And so that was the textbook theory was that fatigue was the result of, in that case, failure to regulate body temperature or it was failure to supply energy from glycogen or it was failure to get oxygen to the muscles. In all these instances it was a failure model and that clearly didn't explain what we were seeing in self-paced exercise because you have that end spurt and you've got differences that happen much earlier and so forth and what I'm building towards is explaining all of that to you and we kick off by looking at the model and then what I'll do is I'll systematically go through the model break it down and explain where the evidence comes from so let's kick off by looking at the slide that introduces that model to you So this is the model and as I mentioned this was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2009 and I will put a link below this clip for those who are interested in reading further about this in more detail but basically it is an anticipatory system as well as a feedback system and the anticipation comes in the form of a number of inputs before exercise even begins and they include your knowledge or anticipation of how long or how far exercise is physiological inputs such as muscle glycogen levels and skin temperature and then the psychological factors like previous experience motivation and the presence of other athletes and external competition. So this here is a crucial thing that has often been overlooked in studies in the laboratory where typically an athlete will just cycle to exhaustion at a fixed workload and under those conditions you have no ability to anticipate how far or how long you have to exercise for. So when you do self-paced exercise you always know that you're doing 10 kilometers or a 40 kilometer time trial on a bicycle or a marathon run and so then you are able to anchor your efforts to a known finish point and that's crucial. These physiological inputs tell you the state of your systems before you begin which is obviously crucial. You know it's a hot day, you know that you are relatively low on glycogen and that will influence your initial pace and then the psychological factors which perhaps is where a sports psychologist or a really good coach can make a large contribution. In any event, all three of these factors pre-exercise contribute to the initial selection of exercise intensity. So we activate a certain amount of muscle and this here in green is an EMG or electromyographic trace and that shows you the electrical activity in the muscle. So it gives us an indication of how much muscle is being activated. And your initial pace that you choose, whether it's to go out at 3 minutes a kilometer or 260 watts, is based on the amount of muscle that is activated at the start by the brain given these inputs and this knowledge. The problem is that as you continue to exercise you cause a number of changes in the physiological systems 
and five of those are shown here. So there are changes in the muscle, there are changes in the cardiovascular system, and I'd include the lungs here. There's changes in metabolism, so if, for example you use glycogen from your liver, and if you use too much obviously you become hypoglycemic. There are metabolic changes, and so that's shown here by the mitochondria. And then there are thermoregulatory changes, so you generate significant amounts of heat, and you have to lose that heat in order to be able to continue exercise. So those are five of the examples of what happens to the physiology. Now, very importantly, we don't have a fuel light like a car does on its dashboard, and we don't have a temperature gauge to, to tell us when we are close to overheating. But what we do have is a rating of perceived exertion. So this is a conscious perception of how our bodies are feeling, and it has two components. One of those is an efferent component, which is made up by the exercise intensity and the way I would interpret it or proposed it, is that this is largely as a result of how much muscle is being activated. It's the efferent or outgoing component. And then there is this very important afferent. And afferent always means feedback. So there is feedback from the muscle, from the lungs and heart, from the liver, met metabolic feedback in the form of lactate, hydrogen, phosphates, and body temperature. And the combination of those two components generates the rating of perceived exertion. Now, what's very important is that each of these five physiological systems can cause fatigue if its capacity is exceeded. So for example, when it comes to body temperature, we know that if your body temperature hits 40 degrees Celsius, you stop exercise. And so that is the, that is the limit or the threshold. Similarly, there is likely a threshold for how low the muscle glycogen levels can drop before you stop exercise. And so if you are going to reach the finish line of this event that you are taking part in, you must regulate these physiological systems in anticipation of reaching that ceiling. You cannot reach that ceiling until the moment that you have crossed the finish line. And so that is the anticipatory component in this model. Now the way that that's achieved in our proposal is by means of the conscious rating of perceived exertion, which would constantly be interpreted throughout exercise against the exercise duration that remains. So in other words, we have a conscious perception of effort. And you can put that on a scale from 0 to 10, or you can verbalize it and say this is hard as opposed to very hard, as opposed to comfortable. But in any event, this rating of perceived exertion will constantly be interpreted and contextualized by the brain against exercise duration that remains. And changes might then be made because the actual rating of perceived exertion exceeds what was expected at a given point. So there's almost a template for how the perception of effort or your conscious sensation of fatigue would change and you constantly interpret how you actually feel against that template. And that's largely a function of learning and training which is obviously crucial and there are psychological factors which are in play here. I just want to give you an illustration of this. If the athlete makes the decision early on to go out very fast, they activate a large amount of muscle. So we would pick that up here, and that causes large physiological perturbations. Let's say that their body temperature starts to rise too rapidly on a hot day. The combination of the fast start and the physiological change here would increase the perception of effort. And at some point, the body would then interpret that, or the brain would interpret that to say that this perception of effort exceeds what was expected, and the result would be to alter the exercise intensity. So that's the basis for how this model would work. It's constant feedback from the physiology, interpreted against the exercise duration remaining, and these pre-exercise inputs. What we need to do now is to go systematically through this. So we block out all these factors and focus in on these pre-exercise inputs and the physiological perturbations. And that will be the subject of the next post in this series. So if that seems obvious, it's because it is. Uh, unless, of course, you had already learned about fatigue according to the model where fatigue was an event or a failure, then perhaps it doesn't seem as obvious. But I think that to most of you, you'll be looking at it and saying, well, that makes perfect sense. We know from experience that that's exactly what happens. We can see it all the time. And so therefore, I don't think there's a challenge to the concept. Maybe the challenge is to understand why the concept is novel. But I think the other thing that needs to be done is to look at the mechanisms. In other words, 
if this pacing strategy exists and if we are able to regulate in anticipation of say heat stroke or running out of oxygen or glycogen then how is that achieved and that's what we will focus on in the next few episodes so if you'll join me over the course of the next week or so I will look at all those factors we'll look at heat we'll look at oxygen we'll look at energy supply and I'll try and explain to you some of the physiology behind why we pace ourselves the way we do so do join me over the course of the next week